over bacon and eggs We'll share a laugh and a story and even a wish On the breakfast dish Bop, bop Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 28th episode of Breakfast Dish. I've just startled my son because for the last 27 episodes, he was introducing. And this week, since it's a new season and it's a new me, it's a new intro. So I'm taking it over this morning. Hope you're all feeling good. Hope you're all bright and sunny. Hope you got your eggs and your bacon and your oatmeal. How are you, my son, Griffin Cork? Have you had a good, healthy breakfast in your tummy? I mean, I, yeah, I guess I have. I had a lot of healthy things for breakfast, but I did have um, French toast crunch, which is something that I saw at Safeway and realized that I had to have in my life. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I do possess that in my in my tummy, as you put it, radio announcer. Isn't that such a great feeling? I still have it at age 54 where you go, I'm an adult and I would like this treat and I don't have to ask anybody's permission to get it. Well, especially because I remember there was a rule when we were shopping with you, me, and Dad, and I was only allowed one treat. And sometimes you considered uh, uh, outlandish things, treats. Craft dinner, you considered a treat, which I, is just not the same thing. And I really wanted... The one candy that I really wanted as a kid was fruit gushers. Those little, like, gummy things with, like, syrupy fruit juice in them. Man, oh, man, those were my favorite. And I, I actually did the thing that happens in a lot of cartoons where I traded people portions of my lunch to get somebody's fruit gushers. That was a real thing I blame thing it all on your father. I wanted you to be happy as a child, but... That's right. And all his yeah. capitalist ideals. How dare I do <laughs> lunch trading? Hey, Griffin, tell everybody what we do on this podcast before we introduce our guest. All right. This old show pony. This is episode 28. You guys, listeners, if you don't know, you better catch up. What we do on The Breakfast Dish is we talk to artists, creatives, photographers, acrobats, clowns, um, brain thinkers, mouth users... And um, other other artists, let's not go into that description, the other artists uh, that have uh, shifted their creative process from um, in person or, or live events, and we've, they've brought it to the digital scope or online presentation or, or socially distant avenues. And um, we're kind of interested in, you know, who they are, what they're doing, and how indeed they are doing that. Digital scope, that was impressive. I don't think we've used that phrase just yet. Yeah, I was trying to make up for mouth users. So, yeah, digital scope, I had to throw in a nicer term. Karen, what's the theme for this episode? You've taken the host throne from me. You've, used, you've usurped me, House Johnson Diamond. So stab the dagger into my neck and tell me what the theme is. The theme is winter is here. Eat hot things for breakfast. Okay, that's perfect. And I cannot wait to hear how that transitions to our guests. Go ahead. It's about keeping warm in the winter. It's about being healthy and keeping warm. You know, like you can you can take a bowl of hot oatmeal or you can take like juggling circus workshops. <laughs> Both of them will raise your body temperature in some very way. Very interesting. Very, yes, very yes. interesting. And you did say that we have clowns on the show, but am I right? This is our first clown like when i say clown i mean clown i think some of our guests have like yeah clown maybe experience or training but this is our first clown <laughs> Cl uh, yeah why don't, why don't you go into that our tr the first true clown the first the, you know like it's clowning for a living is what i'm talking about here got it it's clowning for the world it's clowning to make everybody happy here's something else yeah point at the webcam karen that'll work i have to tie your oma into our guest at some point don't let me forget anyway our guest is the founder of green fools theater <laughs> and it is none other than dean barham Hello, Dean. Hello. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Karen had her fingers on her cheek there because she didn't know if she was getting the titles right. I always panicked, I'm going to say, and here he comes from Green Thumb Theater or something <laughs> stupid like that. Am I right that you're the founder? That is correct. I'm actually co-founder. Uh, Christine Cook and I founded the Green Fools. I and, did not uh, know that. Yeah, cool. we founded together. Um, and I am now the sole artistic director of the Green Fools. 
Yes, you are. I, I could not pick a better background for you currently. I'm seeing like a clown dress with like a frilly tutu sleeve. I'm seeing two giant uh, uh, nutcracker heads, it yes, looks like. Yes, what you're seeing. Yes, it's true. I'm in the costume shop in our costume room in our new space called Studio G. Uh, and it just happens to be the quietest room in the in the house because it's got all this... Uh, it's got all of our costumes against the wall, so it makes a re- great little sound recording studio. Welcome back to the Tech Talk section of The Breakfast Dish. Uh, Griffin often recorded his, in his mother's walk-in closet <laughs> and Dee records in the costume closet. Uh, it's a little life hack for all you tech geeks out there. Eat your Wheaties. That's and right. make your studio out of Walmart eggshell mattress things. That's 30 right. bucks a swath. Hey, tell me about Studio G, because I know nothing about it. Yeah, well, not a lot of people do, because uh, it was... Uh, March 19th last year when we were supposed to open uh, oh. four days before the pandemic and everything shut down. Whoa. So uh, we haven't done an official launch yet, but we have a new space over in uh, Fairview um, uh, and it's a beautiful little space. We just love it so much. Studio G is like a bay warehouse that they decked out for us. The landlords, this place had been sitting empty for many years. And so they were willing to put some money into it. So they built us offices in here. We have a new costume shop. We have a 30 by 50 uh, circus space in the back. Amazing. Above all these uh, offices are all of our storage and all the other costumes and all the big stuff and all our tech stuff. So it's a lovely little space. We just love it so much. And also, uh, one of the things we've never been able to do is... We have a gallery of all of our old shows. So the front lobby is all open. So all of our puppets are there um, from shows from, you know, from the beginning inception of Green Fools all the way to now. So and then we also have the hallway here has got all our posters from all of our shows. So we're super excited to open it up. We can't wait to let people in. Well, this is where I'll tie all my into this story, Griff, because in the lobby that he's talking about in their entranceway, there's going to be some sort of poster or something that represents the Whooping Crane Mm -hmm. Project, which was a Green Fools project that uh, your Oma, my mother, saw uh, even before her 10 years of rabid theater going. This was more than 10 years ago, right, Dean? Oh, yeah. Whooping Crane? Yeah. 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 Whooping Crane is almost uh, 20 years old. Yeah. She went insane. Like, she went insane. She, st- she started emailing Green Fool. She told yeah. me about it. In fact, I think I went to see it on her recommendation, and then she was here in Calgary, and I brought her again. And she's, she's seen gone- it like I think every time we've produced that show, with the exception of when we took it to China or Japan, uh, she's been there. I yep. remember seeing your your Oma. And it has to be like it has to be around fourteen years ago because when Griffin was seven years old, I yeah. think yeah. he did a show with you, the mm-hmm. Paintbrush for Piccolo, with the CPO and is Jonathan Love, and my mom was so excited that Griffin got to work with you. Like this was like <laughs> saying, "Hey, Oma, uh, Griffin's going to be on Saturday Night Live." No, oh. no, never mind that. <laughs> Dean Barham, Green Fools. <laughs> Bless your soul. That's awesome. Yeah, that was fun. I remember that so vividly because I loved that dog. Dean was the was the was the puppeteer of a dog. Yeah on that show and I was a kid and I love that doc I remember David Van Bell who directed it had to go with me once and go hey um, you can't hug the dog that hard it's <laughs> it's made out of like styrofoam like you I it's, know. it's awesome your acting's awesome but it's not as strong as a but real but that's dog. what that's the beautiful thing you know that was the beautiful thing about that show it was so beautiful and the fact that you connected as a as a young actor with this this inanimate object but i mean you know it comes to life you put some strings you breathe life into it oh, and gee, uh, that's what made that sh- that show so beautiful was that you had really connected with that dog and so it, you could feel the love and and well, what i loved about it too actually was <laughs> that whenever you were performing and she was within your realm she was in your space you put a hand on her like you were always like i'll just put my hand on my dog just as anyone would do <laughs> if your dog's there nestling up yeah. beside you you would pet you would always have and like and not once, not once did you ever look at me. Like, I didn't even exist. That dog was completely everything. And it was so beautiful. Like, um, I remember doing that show the first time coming out on stage. And you've got, there's a 60-piece orchestra. Jonathan's telling a beautiful story. This is a beautiful kid actor. But when Bella hits the stage, no one else exists. No You one. and Bella were yeah. the only oh, yeah. thing that existed on that stage. 
Yeah, it was a beautiful thing. You're, you're granting a lot of permissions to my uh, seven-year-old theatrical instinct. I don't know that necessarily I instilled life oh, no, into, you the, did. into you the totally puppet. Did. I, I really, I very much believed. <laughs> like I, I guess in a way, I was, I was almost tricked. Yeah. No, you. It's <laughs> it's the beauty, of the magical theater, right? You make people if the if the actors believing it. It was just a lovely relationship. I want to go back on a second. I want to say Anne Gatha as the writer of Paintbrush for Piccolo. I should credit where credit oh, is yeah. due. I think. Okay, for sure, Good. and and did a beautiful job yeah. with that. It's a book, everyone. It's a book. We had done, we've done that show. Uh, we did that show another time, a little bit later. We took that show to uh, to Ottawa for at the. Uh, we did it at the NAC, and uh, you were you had grown. You were a little too tall for the role at that point anymore. So <laughs> we got a young lady that had to play you because they couldn't find someone that was so a young gal played piccolo in that show but she had the same experience that she had the exact same thing this kind of connection with the puppet which just makes brings magic to the stage so yeah that was a pretty cool experience i used to love watching sesame street as i was growing up because whenever the muppets would sit and have conversations with the kids i was always like not as i was growing up i didn't recognize it growing up and as an adult i'd I'd recognize that the kids never looked down at the puppeteer behind the bench or behind the table or whatever they were always totally engaged with the puppet and i used to think that's like that is the masterful work of a puppeteer to make a kid not look to see whose hands up who's whatever <laughs> i mean let's face it i became a puppeteer and a clown because i used to watch sesame street well i don't know if you know this but i have two dreams in my life one is to marry neil diamond too late and the second <laughs> is to work with muppets i have videos of me being ernie and kermit at, with griffin who's three years old and us having conversations what Wait. Oh yeah, wait, I have a video. Wait, 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 wait. He's wait, like, what? Wait a How minute. How did you embarrass me, Mom? What? You have videos of me talking to Kermit and Ernie and they're not in my demo reel? What are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, you know what? I have the same thing with Muppets. I had all the puppets, and I perfected all my voices. I had Kermit down. I go Kermit the Frog here, and uh, I, you know, I had Adabal. Uh, I even had my own drum set that I made, and I Miss Piggy. Oh, Kermit! You know, I just I I worked all the voices. I, you know, it was a thing. It made me crazy. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to suggest. Uh, we brought Dean on the show to talk about the Community Circus Project with Green Fool Cedar. But no, no, no. That's all That's all going by the wayside because we're going to have Dean go through every Muppet that there ever has been. Yeah. How about that? How about I, how about I tell you about the Community Circus uh, as Fozzie, Fozzie Bear? How about that? That's good. I would say do the first two sentences as Fozzie Bear and then maybe the third sentence is Rizzo the Rat and then you can go back to your normal voice. Waka, waka, waka. Okay. Community Circus. Big time. Uh, okay, I, I don't know. I, I can't do rats, all. but uh, <laughs> community circus. Um, yeah, community a community circus project. So as you were talking about ways to keep warm, you know, we we've been here. We've been doing a lot of online stuff. We've been doing a lot of you know workshops, and we've been doing just information videos and covid messaging and stuff and uh we were like how do we activate people at this point we're all going crazy we're losing our minds we're stuck inside we need to get physical so what we wanted to do is support mental and physical health so we came up with this concept of the community circus program and what it basically what it is is we're doing the entire month of march we are doing 30-day challenges every day there'll be a new challenge by a new artist so they'll either be physical or mental but some sort of a challenge that activates your mind and what we're trying to do is encourage people to to shoot themselves videotape that and then post it on their social media and link us so we're trying to activate people physically oh great so we have things like you know i'm gonna do this weird challenge where i make you know you make a square with one hand and a triangle with the other and see if you you know these kind of things and yeah I, you see the, the radio listeners cannot see karen trying that <laughs> which is very amusing um i failed but anyways so so that's the first ring is basically this idea of a physical daily challenge every month every day of the month and the second ring we're calling it a three ring circus the second ring is there are 23 free workshops being offered in physical theater clown circus 23 23 different workshops we've got juggling for free free. everything's for free um oh my god so we are we've got um local lots of local talent we've got local jugglers local acrobats uh we're you know what we're doing is we're 
we're trying to be safe about this because obviously you can't have people swinging on trapezes in their house. Uh, so we're doing things, we're sort of adjusted it so that it can be really tangible and really uh, attainable for people. Mm -hmm. um, so we're keeping them fairly simple, but we're doing like juggling workshops of all different kinds. Um, we have a handstand workshop. We have, uh, we're doing a family pyramid with Jonathan Love, actually. Jonathan <laughs> J. Love's family. I've, I've recruited his family and they're going to do family pyramids together and they'll be my sort of my demonstrations for people to do pyramids together with your family. We have a, a, young, a gentleman named Fabian from Cirque du Soleil who's actually in Argentina. So he's going to be teaching a class live from Argentina. So he's our advanced Diablo class. So he's going to be teaching that. And he's also teaching uh, flower sticks. We've got another Cirque du Soleil person, uh, Stacy Clark, who's going to be teaching the handstand stuff. So we really got a lovely group of people. We uh, bring Lisa Floyd in to do a, cir a circus makeup class. Uh, Judith Mendelson wow. is doing a dance class. Uh, we just have so much different stuff going on. So, And then the third ring is that what we're doing is encourage everyone to shoot a video of themselves doing it. And then we're doing a presentation on April 1st. It's the final show. And and we're asking people to submit their videos and we will mix it in with professionals. So I'm going to have all the, all the people who are, you know, in the biz, uh, they're sh we're shooting them as well. And so we're going to have a big show and we're encouraging people to, what we're doing is doing cross promotions. We're not asking restaurants to donate food, but what we're asking them to do is maybe create a fun cocktail and a circus themed dinner. And so people can order dinner. We're going to have a list of restaurants that they can order from. So we're trying to promote local businesses. We have a deal with the costume shop where uh, if people want to take Lisa's class, they can get their makeup at the costume shop and, and they're kicking back to the Green Fools. So we're doing this cross promotional thing. We're not asking any, we know everybody's hurting and we don't, we just couldn't imagine going out and asking for people to fund this. So we're funding it ourselves. It's going to be super fun. And that final show is going to be fantastic. So that's the Community Circus Project in a nutshell. I want to do it. I want to do it. Okay. I'm tying back to Oma. Is there a stilt walking workshop? Because at some point you promised my mother that before she was 80, you would teach her how to walk on stilts. What? I, I don't remember when you said that. But I uh, imagine that's so tough to do from a distance. Yeah, like we're not <laughs> We're not actually doing a stilt walking workshop. But I, if you tell your Oma, if I will personally get her up on stilts and make sure she does that. I will take care of her and I will make sure she will do it. She will do it. You have a year and three months because she turns 80 next year on May 21st. Anytime. I will get her up on some stilts, I promise. I'm ready. <laughs> I'll do it. Anytime. I just no totally problem. put you on the spot there. Hey, this is a podcast that's going to be broadcast. Do something nice for my mom. That's right. Dean, we can't <laughs> wait to have you on to force you to commit to our family's enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, so here's a, here's an interesting little thing I'll tell you about. So the Green Fools, as you know, we've been doing social circus for many years. Uh, we work with a lot of at risk youth, we work with new immigrants, refugees, indigenous, uh, and we work with various partners like Ca Kids Up Front, Calgary Catholic Immigration Society, um, Bridge Foundation, just all these different organizations that work with youth who, who couldn't possibly afford to do this. And over the last few years, we've been very lucky to have a partnership with Cirque du Soleil, where they would donate money to our program to ensure that kids get to take our programs for free. And also, when they come to Calgary, they give me 100 tickets to give away to take kids to go see the show so these kids get to go see a Cirque du Soleil show and Amazing. I've been really 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 pleased with that now it's one of the problems with the pandemic is of course they're closed and their whole philanthropic side is also closed so it's been it's been tricky so our biggest thing is we want to provide opportunities for kids to to do this and right now this is the best way to do it and yep. because it's because it's on you know it's online and it's it's virtual uh, we can get kids all across Canada. So what I was trying to get to is we have a partnership with this group in Montreal called Circle Piste. They're a nonprofit organization that works with social social circus as well. And, you know, we've been out in the prairies operating in our own little bubble for so long. Um, we knew we know of other organizations, but we didn't think anybody knew about us. And last year we were invited to go to this conference in February to Montreal to take part in 15 different organizations doing social circus with kids. And in come the Green Fools and our little team and everybody knows who we are. Nobody Amazing. here knows what we do, but there in Montreal everyone's like, oh, it's the Green Fools because we've been working with Cirque and they produce videos for us. And, and what we didn't realize is that we probably work with more kids, almost as many kids over a year as all the other 15 companies do. Wow. Last year, before the pandemic, we, we had over 4,000 kids through our programs. Wow. So we have this massive impact. And so it's really been stalled, which is, you know, that's one of the hardest things. And one of the reasons why we want to do this festival is that 
that way we we can get those kids back involved and we're selling it to all our our partners and all the other kids from the 15 other social circus groups across Canada can also take part. So we're really trying to make it a national kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. It it feels like you're covering literally every aspect I can think of, of, of a, of a successful online production in the sense that there is uh, like, there's the smaller kind of daily activities like the, I mean, I, I say small, I can't do a square and a triangle with my fingers either. There's free, classes. Amazing. There is both a performance opportunity for people to get involved with, as well as that performance opportunity is then broadcasted for people who are just looking to consume things. Or they can also just take the workshop if they want, and they don't even have to do the performance, so they can just better themselves And they're learning privately. from, like, the upper echelons of the upper echelons. <laughs> uh, Cirque du Soleil, Jonathan Love. And... You're supporting local businesses uh, throughout all that. It's that's crazy. That's crazy. Well, yeah, it is kind of, but <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, you know, like we're all we've always been about community. You know, the fools. We exist in a different plane. We're a theater company and circus company, and people know us for many different things over the years. We used to be known for the, the company that has these crazy adult Halloween parties, but then we kind of grew out of those, right? Because. Uh, because they'd made no money and they were a lot of work. And, um, and mm-hmm. then people forgot why they were coming to them. The, the original concept behind the Halloween Howls were that they were uh, perform, a, a chance to perform and really push the boundaries of what's, what you can do in theater and cabaret. And then what we discovered is that people stopped realizing why they were coming. Ah. And then when the performance happened, they were like, oh, there's, there's a performance. Let's go watch the band. So and when that happened, we were like, okay, we've outgrown this. And then about six, seven years ago, we decided, because we've always been sort of between both worlds, the adult theater and the kids theater and the roving stuff at festivals and all that. And we finally said, you know what? We really are a family-based organization. So let's just embrace that. Let's let go of the adult stuff. There's lots of new companies. There's lots of young blood out there to do that stuff. And that's awesome. And, and I support them 100%. But we were just like, let's just focus on families and kids. Let's really focus in on this. And then since that's happened, I mean, I've been doing social circus for over 20 years. I've been, I go to Northern Manitoba every year for the last 25 years to teach in small, small res communities with the uh, Winnipeg Children's Festival. And then I started doing those programs myself in Northern BC, Northern uh, Alberta. I've gone far north as the Arctic. I've taught in uh, Taktiak Tuk. I've taught in Inuvik. I've taught in Iqaluit. I've taught in Nunavik. Um, so I've worked with those really remote communities. And so what I realized is that we have just as much need here. It just is not as prevalent in a city as you when you see it in a community. Mm-hmm. Like in the north, you know, like the stats are just staggering. More kids commit suicide than graduate. And when I started finding that out, I was like, we need to make a difference and have an impact. So part of part of my mission in life is to get circus and social circus recognized as a essential service in schools. Like in Montreal, for example, Montreal has done so much work um, uh, getting recognized the importance of social circus because of all the things that are good about it. Like it's physical. It's about physical literacy. It's non-competitive. It's, uh, it's about teamwork. It's, um, it's empowering. It's about self-empowerment. And then they've got, they've, they've got recognition of being a, an essential service. So during the pandemic, they've been able to stay open. Whereas in Alberta, I don't have that recognition. Right, so right. I'm working with a national-wide um, organization through the, the Ecole Nationale de Cirque. And we are trying to make social circus recognized in all schools all across Canada. And that should become part of the curriculum because... You need to empower kids yeah. and we need, to, and there's not every kid is into sports. There's nothing wrong with sports, but not every kid is into it, you know? And so when we start going into schools, like over the last few years, we've worked really hard to try to get into schools and it's not the arts programs that are bringing us in. It's the gym teachers. And they talk to each other and they say, look, I got more, I've got more kids coming into my gym when circus is on. Then I, I've never seen half these kids in school, you know? <laughs> so that's the beautiful thing. I mean, the power of circus is like, there's, a, there's kind of a, There's kind of a, you know, as a kind of a fancy showy kind of notion to it. But at the same time, it's really about empowering, you know. So that's what we that's what we do. We want to empower youth and make them, uh, you know, because I was a juvenile delinquent. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah. You know, I got that hardened, hardened look. (laughs) So funny when you said juvenile delinquent, you leaned into the camera and your shoulders went up like Gustavo. (laughs) Gustavo. I was a nasty child, too. (laughs) 
<laughs> but, uh, you know, and so I, I was, I mean, I was just a little nasty little kid because, you know, my family was, my parents were busy working and, uh, and we were real middle class, lower, you know, we didn't have money. I didn't have money to go skiing and do all those things. So what do you do when you're a kid? You get in trouble. And it really literally was theater that saved my life. Uh, Gary Stromsmo. I don't know if you know that name, Karen, but he was, uh, no. uh, Michael Green studied under him. There's so many different artists that ah. study with him at Western Canada. Um, and he really changed my life. He just, you know, he he impacted me in such a strong way. And I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that guy for that. Because, you know, I, I remember it was grade 10. I got into high school. I got into my first play. And I missed a rehearsal because I got in a fight in the cafeteria with some of these guys that I used to hang out with who didn't like the fact that I was not hanging out with them anymore. So I got in a fight and I got suspended for a day. And I remember coming into rehearsal and he just said to me, like, look, if you ever miss another bleeping rehearsal, you will never be in another play ever. And I just was like, Whoa. okay. So that was it. Like I, I let go of who I was and I just gave myself 100% into, into theater. You know? There's so many times I hear theater saved my life. Like, I can't believe how many times I hear that phrase. This teacher's name again was who? Gary Stromsmo. And is he still with us? Uh, he, as far as I know, he taught at Western Canada for years. And then he went over to Queenie for a few years. Uh, and then he retired. But um, he worked with the rabbits in the early days. He created a bunch of crazy shows. He wrote a show, one of the weirdest rabbit, one of the weirdest rabbit shows I've ever seen called Rusty Buster Dimple and Wiener Review. And, and it was a court case about a woman who was suing her husband because something about he gave her a van, but she had to trade it for sexual favors. And then it was like 100 sexual favors. But at 99, she said, forget it. And then he sued her. It was a true case. <laughs> And then the Sorry, audience. This, this, is a, this is a real story. This is a real story, and this was, and he turned it into a play. And the audience got to be the judge and jury, and they give everyone puppets on their hands. So here's a pull back. There's a segue back to the. They everyone had everyone had puppets on their hands, and they were the judge and jury, and they actually got to judge the characters on stage during this crazy show, and it was done in some mysterious, weird location, and you know one of these secret locations of the Rabbit Sea Studio. So I never forget that show. I don't know how that came up. <laughs> Gary Strumpsmo, he wrote it. We had <laughs> Sheldon Elter on just before Christmas, who was talking about a teacher that completely inspired him. I love it when that comes up in a podcast. Like, I'm here because of... Mm -hmm. Who are you here because of, Griff? My two teachers I would have to give a, a, a super special nod to would be um, um, Marie Du Amaral, William Aberhart High, as my as my drama teacher. And uh, I, I don't think I ever learned his first name, Jay Riley. Jay Riley at Colonel Irvin Junior High. Mr. Riley was um <laughs> not a drama teacher, fully admitted it himself, no. but did his darkest. The other thing is he didn't want to be, but he was pretty good at it. But boy oh boy, he wanted to teach art and graffiti and French, and that's it. But he was also teaching drama. <laughs> so he made and I think he kind of adapted our grade seven show was Robin in the Hood. <laughs> and it was just kind of a gangster Robin Hood. And I was I was Friar Tuck and I was dressed as a pimp, like with the full fuzzy hat and a cane. And I was in grade seven. And these two uh, grade nine girls came on with me on stage and gave me kisses on the cheek and then walked wow. away, which I didn't really kind of clock it until... <laughs> Like, whatever, grade 11, I was like, wow, this is crazy that this is happening at junior high. Anyway. You are so OG. It was, it was crazy. Wait, what's OG? Original gangster is what, is what, what the phrase means. Thank you. <laughs> because I went with obstetric and gynecology. That's where I went. Well, so, <laughs> some people, some people just, just use it as a replacement for the word original, which isn't yeah. like sometimes you'll be in yeah. a meeting and go, yeah, I want to get back to like the, like the OG kids theater company, which is different when it's an original gangster yeah. theater company. Um, I'd say Green Fools was gangster. Oh, we used to be really gangster. Gee. Oh, I still think you goodness. are. goodness. Well, you know, it's a different kind of gangster. Now we're like... In the sense that, like, it's a mob <laughs> and it's a, a mob that people are drawn to. That's right. It's the circus mafia. That's what it is. Ooh. Yep. My, I'm here because of Irene Sokolotowski and Jan Henderson. Jan Henderson. Jan Henderson. I was going to say. Clown. Oh, yeah, of course. It all comes back to clowning. People, it all comes back to clowning. <laughs> it's a good base, you know. It's funny, you know, clown work is one of those things that a lot of people, are, like it sort of became really popular over the last, you know, 15, 20 years. You know, I think John and John Turner and uh, Mike Kennard from Mump and Smoot really started this adult clown kind of uh, genre, you know, where clowns were always kind of like 
kids stuff or but I was exposed to you know street clown and European style clown early on because back in like you know the early 90s where Christine Cook and I were young renegades and we we discovered street performing right so we decided to make street show we had a lovely person Dick Finkel who used to run the uh, Edmonton Street Performers uh, Society he uh, he believed in us and he gave us our first shows on the street which just got me that just hooked me in and that's where Gustavo was born that's where, you know, um, Teddy, my clown Teddy was born on the street. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some funny stories about Gustavo because Christine and I created a show together called The Frying Fool Show. And our finale was I would be on the stilts. I would do the stilt escape of death over five flaming cars while holding a rubber chicken. And then chi- Christine would whip the rubber chicken out of my hands with a bullwhip and catch it in a frying pan. And so we would do this on the street in Europe. And then, you know. And meanwhile, when I stand over the cars, my stilts catch on fire. She's whipping me. She's whipping me around the neck. She's whipping me around the arm. She pulls me down with my stilts on fire. And then she goes over and gets what looks like a fire extinguisher, but it's actually full of pressurized ether. So she sprays in this giant fireball. I mean, it was wild because you had to be wild in Europe to get the crowds, right? Because um, the European street performers were so much more edgy and and so we had to do that to get crowds. So then we did that for a while. But Christine decided, mm, it's not my thing. And so we actually, we had bought a vehicle in England. And we were driving it all over Europe for a couple of years. And then we were going to sell the vehicle in the Czech Republic to our friends who were glass blowers who were blowing glass up in the Bohemia part of Czech Republic. So we drove all across Europe, got there. And when we got there, they didn't want the vehicle anymore. Like, I oh, it's the hundred it. sexual favors story. <laughs> right back, right? <laughs> so, so then here I am. I'm stuck in the Czech Republic, and Christine's staying, and I'm trying to get back to Canada. So, I my first solo shows were on the Alexander Bridge in Prague, um, and the funny thing was, was at lunch you weren't really allowed to perform there, but the, all the security guards would leave at noon and take off for an hour. So as soon as the security guards left, all the street performers would rush to the bridge. We all set up and we do shows for an hour. And then we take off at the end of that, right? So we'd rush out, do shows. You know, I remember there was a guy with a piano. who used to push the piano up this cobbly <laughs> thing to get out, play the piano. And I'm doing my crazy shows. I made enough money to get back to Amsterdam to get back to Canada. But he literally, that's how, how Gustavo was born on the street, really. You know, he, uh, my solo show was like bus, trial and error, you know. So Community Circus Project will definitely involve uh, how to street perform, how to uh, break the law, and how to bullwhip with fire. And- That's right. If you do all three rings uh, and uh, you can unlock the secret fourth ring, and the only challenge is you have to, you have to push a piano up a cobblestone street. Exactly. Okay, so what happens when I really want to take these workshops? Where do I go? What's the logistics of it? They're all online. You go to our website and we have a registration. So we, we just ask people to register so we know how many people are taking the classes. All the classes are laid out there, all 23 classes, and you just register. That's all you got to do. And we'll send you a confirmation Zoom link and they're all going to be done on Zoom. And yeah, it's pretty straightforward. And then we're going to have us, we're setting up a page. So when people have something to submit, they can just send it to a certain email. And then we're going to take all those uh, videos and we will edit those in the last week. Uh, We're trying to get everything by the third week of March. So we have about five days to place all the pieces. And uh, yeah, and then if you want to enjoy the show, you can order from one of these amazing restaurants. Uh, The La Heat House is actually being one of the restaurants that's going to take part. So you can get yourself a beautiful bottle of wine and a lovely dinner and and we'll all sit around and watch the show together. So, And the show is going to be hosted by Ethan Hawke, who is our uh, newscaster uh, from GFN. He's our anchor or co-anchor man, and he's going to host it. We're, we're going to make it feel like it's a live show, but of course we're going to pre-record it because I have seen what happens when people try to do live shows. And I have to. Terribly wrong. And when does uh, registration uh, uh, begin? Registration is open now. It is all open. Oh, get on it, people. Yeah. But we have some awesome, really amazing other artists. And Jeff Olenek, for example, because he's a great juggler and he's actually a better juggler than me. So, (laughs) Listen to this segue, Griff. Speaking of juggling, do you have a number of social handles that you want to pitch for us? Yeah, it's uh, at Green Fools on Instagram. Uh, We are at Green Fools Theatre on Facebook. You know, what we have now is really great, actually. If you want to go to our YouTube page, Green Fools Theatre, three separate words. We've got a YouTube page. It's got all of... uh, we will be posting any of the videos that are... There's some videos, for example, that will be tutorials that will be available all 
month, like the dance one, like the uh, acro one will be available all month, like uh, the uh, f- devil sticks with Fabium from uh, Argentina. Uh, so there'll be some that'll be available to for you to just practice all month, and those will be on the YouTube page. But we'll, we'll j- we're just keeping linking everything back to Instagram, Facebook, uh, and our and our website. We have a brand new website that's coming, going to be launched in about a week. Um, so we're really excited about that. We actually have a store now. So a lot of these, a lot of the things that we're we're doing, some of them require material and goods. And Green Fools just happens to be supplying all this juggling equipment now. So we have. Anything you need. We got clown noses to buy. You can buy, um, you know, anything you need for these workshops. Stilts. Yes, you can get stilts. But we're not teaching that, Karen. <laughs> He's so cautious to answer that question for you now, Karen. But I am teaching a class just for your Oma. Okay. You're going to email me after so that I can tell her about it? We're so on that. <laughs> I have to give a lovely little thank you to the Calgary Arts Development Authority, the Rosé Foundation, and the Calgary Foundation. The intro music you just heard and the outro music you're about to hear is by Alexander Kalman, and all graphic design for The Breakfast Dish has been done by Morgan Ermter. If you are doing a, I don't know, online, socially distant piece of art that you want to talk to us about, you can email us at thebreakfastdish at gmail.com. Rate us. We're all on all your podcast things. Give us a nice little review. Come on. Come on. Um, Karen, what's going on this week? Alberta Playwrights Network is presenting the Youth Riot readings. These are playwrights from the LGBTQ2S plus community. Youth Riot's awesome. Youth Riot's is awesome. Uh, February 20th at 7 p.m. You can email f- to book in Trevor at Alberta Playwrights Network.com. All one word. Uh, there's a winter virtual market, February 18th to 21st. It's offered by the Little Modern Market.com. That's free. And so are the readings for APN. And then Theatre Just Because up in Fort McMurray is presenting an online workshop on Saturday, March 27th from 2 to 4 p.m., The Art of Drag with fabulous drag queen Sima Down. I think this one's in person. You'll have to check. It's at the Suncor Energy Center of Performing Arts. It's $20. You should check out theaterjustbecause.com. Well, speaking of simmering down, as we are coming to a close, Dean, thank you very much for joining us on The Breakfast Dish with your crazy van stories uh how we like <laughs> to end the breakfast dish usually is karen will make up a breakfast scene question that you get to answer here we go three two one gustavo's making me eat something disgusting for breakfast what is it <laughs> he has a gun you're going to eat grits <laughs> just plain grits yeah we're stopping we're stopping the <laughs> podcast right now i want the last word to be grits <laughs> <laughs> thank you dean you are most awesome uh, it was so fun thanks you guys what a pleasure This has been The Breakfast Dish.